On the show today, we sit down with Jen Mueller, America's expert talker who is rarely at a loss for words. A 16-year sports broadcasting veteran, Jen currently serves as the Seattle Seahawks sideline radio reporter as well as the Seattle Mariners television broadcast team on Root Sports. Jen launched Talk Sporty to Me in 2009 and teaches business professionals how to improve communication and leverage fandom in business. Join us as she shares her experiences earning her own Super Bowl ring and her time with Baseball Hall of Famer Ken Griffey Jr. This is The Career Cue, the podcast focused on helping you navigate the signals in your career to keep you growing and moving forward in business and in life. Here's today's host, Stacey Harris. So welcome to the show, Jen. It's so great to have you here. It is so fun to be here. I'm really looking forward to this conversation because sports are everywhere. And when I started looking into the books that you've written and the the great newsletter that you send out every week, I'm like, how does sports apply to business? But we'll get into that. But I actually want to start with how you got to where you are today. So Jen Mueller's professional story or professional journey. I think probably it comes down to a lot of stubbornness would be <laughs> would be the best way to put that. You know, I, my high school guidance counselor actually made the suggestion to me as a junior in high school, I wanted to be a third grade Lutheran school teacher. And I'd wanted to be a teacher for as long as I can remember. I like that interaction. I like being able to coach somebody up and to be able to teach somebody. And she said, you know, I know that that's what you like, but you also like to talk a lot and you're not afraid to talk in front of other people. Have you just thought about anything else, you know, maybe like broadcasting? And up until that moment, it had not crossed my mind. But I thought, you know what, I can give it a shot. And, you know, me being the type A personality who's going to make the list and the plans and the backup plans, I thought, worst case scenario, I go to school for broadcasting. It doesn't work out. I take a few more classes. I get a teaching certificate. And I can end up being very happy doing what I'm doing. So I went to school knowing that I wanted to be in broadcast. I have always been a sports fan. I have always played sports and been very competitive. That was the natural fit for me. So I did all of the classes that you were supposed to take. I did all the internships, and they were all focused around sports. Getting into the industry, most people, if they knew that they wanted to be on air, you'd go to a small market, you would, you know, make $16,000 a year, you would be covering, you know, smaller events in a small town. That's not the way it worked out for me. I actually got into the industry in Dallas, which is where I went to school, and then in Seattle as an associate sports producer. So I was behind the scenes. And then I gradually worked my way to being the producer, which meant that, you know, every night I was the person who was writing the scripts and setting the sports casts for my anchor. But in the back of my mind, I always knew that I wanted a shot to be on television. And so it was up to me in those years, which were six or seven years, to take advantage of the resources that I had at the studio. Mm -hmm. So when everybody else went home at midnight, I had the run of the place to start editing my own things, to work on my voiceover, to write my own stories, and then have them critiqued by my mentor and my boss the next day. And this wasn't just a one-time deal. This was years and years and years and weekends and weekends and weekends of going, seriously, Jen, what are you doing? (laughs) Like, don't you just want to go home? Like, who is paying attention to you? And I'm glad that I did And here's what happened. When I was hired to be part of the Seattle Mariners broadcast and and the television station I currently work for, the person who hired me is also the person who hired me when I initially moved to Seattle. He hired me as a producer. He knew that I could do that role. Mm -hmm. That's the job that they had open. And I said, I would love to take that job. And I've been working on my on-air skills over here on the side. Would you take a look at this? If I am terrible and you see no room for me to get any better, I will happily just be a producer. But if you see any aptitude at all, would you please give me a chance to be on air once a week and grow those opportunities? And he agreed to that. And within about a month, there was an instance where they needed somebody who could both produce a show and host that show. And that's how I moved into a basically full-time on-air role, I am still listed as a producer. I still do all of the things that I was initially hired to do. 
and more. That's incredible. So you actually went in, and it sounds like it was almost kind of like a lateral move into mm-hmm. that producer role, working for someone that had previously hired you. And I love the fact that you said, I'm willing to do that and, right? Yes. Because you had a personal journey that you were wanting to look to, and you were also open to that feedback about, am I even a viable candidate for this in the future, right? Yes. And that you didn't say it had to happen in 30 days, that you were open to that journey. Well, and one of the reasons I said that, and you're right, it was basically a lateral move at the time. My previous employer had given very strong indications that there was no chance for me to move up. Mm -hmm. There was nothing else for me to go to. And being on air at that station was not a viable option. And I was told in no uncertain terms that that was not going to happen. And so, yes, sometimes in your career, you're going to have to make the lateral move to make a bigger jump. Looking back, I don't know what would have happened had I not taken Mm -hmm. that jump. You Mm -hmm. know, the the opportunities, the things I've gotten to do, I I couldn't imagine being happier. And at the time, I remember being so frustrated Mm. and so um, just beat down over the whole process. And to know that there's going to be those moments in your career. Yeah. And you can choose to keep going, and there's probably something better out there. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're getting some roadblocks thrown up, okay, it's time to figure out how to go around them or over them. Yeah, but you were able to do a sidestep for greater opportunity eventually, right? And whether it was a month down the road or a year that you saw the potential, you felt that there was something bigger out there for you as Jen Mueller. And it wasn't necessarily going to be a you know, perfect situation for other people, but it was going to be the right fit for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's very scary for a lot of people too. In addition to being frustrated, were you kind of a little apprehensive about making that change? Absolutely. Yeah. I remember telling my mentor, who was also our main sports anchor, you know, I I had these moments of panic and I said, you know, I worked at this station for six years. There's a safety net. I feel really comfortable, Mm -hmm. right? I'm really good at my job. But if anything were to happen, I know that you guys are there to catch me, right? We work together really well as a team. And he said, don't worry about it. You know, you're going to be fine moving to this other station, you're going to end up having the same support system around you. We're not going to go away. I'll still be here. You can still come back. You know, I still talk to him when I need to bounce an idea off of him. But absolutely, it was scary. And, you know, this is also where the stubbornness came in. People probably don't realize that in broadcasting and in journalism, this is not um, the huge money-making career that people think it is. It's portrayed one way on television or the glamour of it all. For 10 years, I worked three jobs to pay the bills. Mm. And when you work in television, you don't get to go and get a side job at Starbucks or at Safeway because you could be called away at any time to go cover any breaking news event. So I put other skills to use. I was an organist at church every Sunday morning. I taught piano lessons in the mornings before I would go to work. I taught swim lessons at a Y so that I could set my hours and I could be very clear and upfront with folks that said, you know, look, this is my job over here. If I need to go, I have to go, right? But I had to figure out a way to pay the bills. You have to decide what's worth it for Mm -hmm. you in the end. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of days where I worked seven days a week. I would go from one job to the next job. And looking back, again, I wouldn't change. You can't learn those lessons any other way. But that's the stubbornness of was I scared to make a job change? Yes. Did I trust in my abilities to figure out a way to get something done? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I I think that's fantastic advice right there because anyone that's thinking of making a change right now but wanting, not sure whether they're ready to move out of that comfort zone, right? And if you find yourself feeling too comfortable, it might be time to poke your head up and go, so what is going to stretch me? What is going to make me feel like, ooh, am I doing the right thing? But at your core, you believed. And no one does you like you, right? And if you're willing to invest the time in your growth and um, the, the hard work that it takes in order to be able to grow, then it's going to be worth it in the end, you know? And the end is not even... The end, right? It's just a continuous evolution of, and so that leads us where we are today. I mean, 
you know, when you started out, that conversation that you had as a junior with your high school counselor, did you ever believe that you were going to be surrounded by these football players in these locker rooms, you know, and was that a part of your vision or was it just, yeah? No. I mean. Well, and you have to remember, this is how old I am, but there were (laughs) women in sports at the time, just not very many of them. And so my goal, I thought the highest I could possibly achieve would be a main sports anchor at a local television station. Hmm. Now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Right. Um, that's. I didn't realize at the time I wasn't on that path. I couldn't do that based on the choices I had made earlier to be a producer and all these other things. Instead, I now work for a regional network. I'm seen in a five-state region. You know, I've covered a perfect game. I have covered no hitters. I work for the Seattle Seahawks. I have a Super Bowl ring with them. I've been to two Super Bowls. No, that was not even close to being on my radar. And so, you know, I tell people, one day this ride is going to end, right? And and I know this. You know, women on TV have a certain career span, which is why I started my own company to have a backup plan to that. But when that day happens, I will walk away and know that I have done everything I possibly could do and more right. than I thought I could ever accomplish. And I will be happy. I'll be sad. And I will feel very accomplished and be very happy. Well, and it also sounds like you saw the track of the the career path at the time for your chosen field. And there was a beautifully written job description and an ideal of what that would look like. But it sounds like you've actually written your own. You've written your own job description. The job description that was written around you, not that you were trying to step into this perfectly written job description, which I think is a fallacy anyway. There is no perfectly written job description. But when you looked before or ahead of where you were at that time throughout your college career and your post-college career, there could have been a very linear path for you Mm -hmm. to take. Absolutely. But in actual fact, you've written the Jen Mueller job description um, and that it's specifically written for you. Yeah. And I think that part of this is like you talk about the fallacy of a perfectly written job description. You're right. And guess what? There are still things that I don't like about my job. Everybody has those (laughs) things, right? But if you're looking at where your career path is going, just get started. Put yourself in a situation where you at least have opportunities and options. If I knew that this is where I wanted to be in sports, then me taking a job answering phones at a sports team was not going to get me to the same place as becoming a sports producer for a television station that put me in front of these teams every single day. And when a job came open, guess who's been there every single day, right? Part of it is just you got to figure out which path you want to be on and plunk yourself down somewhere in the middle of that. Stop waiting for that perfect job to come to you. But just start down the path because you have to get exposure to these folks and people need exposure to you. And the only way they're going to get that is if you start going down that path. And if you show up. That's right. right? Let's touch on that before we actually get into uh, the next piece. You just mentioned that you have to be there every single day for when that opportunity arrives. And you can get into colorful hallway conversations with people about what luck is, but ultimately it's being prepared for when the opportunity comes Mm -hmm. along. It sounds like you had a goal in mind. So let's go into that a little bit. You showed up in a capacity that it kind of seems like you had no reason to be there, (laughs) but you turned up anyway because it was a part of your goal that you had for you. So I often tell people that having a Super Bowl ring, and it does actually have my name on it, so it is mine, is my greatest networking accomplishment and achievement. It is something that I wanted to do. I wanted to be the Seahawks sideline radio reporter. Now, I didn't know this when I moved to Seattle. What I knew in college was this. I need to find a niche, and I need somebody to take me seriously. I became a football official in college. I spent 10 years officiating high school football. I loved it. I loved the challenge. I loved the competition. But I also knew in the back of my mind that it was going to set me apart from everybody else trying to get these jobs, right? And it was going to, I thought, 
get some of these guys and teams and players and coaches to take me more seriously. It, it doesn't matter what level you officiate at. I know how to read a rule book. I know how to interpret rules, all of this good stuff. I get to Seattle. I see that there's actually this job. And this woman who is in the job was a former colleague of mine. She was doing a killer job. And I had no intention of replacing her. But I went to the producer of the game broadcast and I said, hey, you know what? If this gal ever decides to make a change, would you just keep me in mind? I I would love a chance to try out for that. And I I expressed this to him a number of times. And it was, I want to make it very clear. I was not trying to oust her. I was not in competition. It was just, hey, I'm interested. And every year for six years, not only did I have the same conversation just in passing, hey, I'm still interested if that job ever comes open, but I was at every single Seahawks practice, press conference, and game that my schedule would allow me to attend. That is in addition to doing my real full-time job. So any spare time I had was spent at the Seahawks facility, which probably looked a little bit like overkill. (laughs) But what happened was everybody got a chance to know me, and they got a chance to know that I was serious about this. In addition to being a football official, in addition to saying I'm interested, no, no, I'm serious about this because this is now on my own time. And I'm there in an appropriate fashion, and I'm asking the right questions, and I'm learning about the organization. So when the job actually came open and this gal decided to move on and move out of state— I had the chance to audition, but it was easy because I'd already immersed myself in the culture and the team, and I knew what was going on. And And I kind of joke, I, I think they figure they should probably just start paying me for being <laughs> around anyway, right? But it's the time spent, in, and that really was a networking play. It took six years. Yeah. I paid to go to training camp in Cheney, Washington. I used my vacation week, and I paid hundreds of dollars to go to Cheney, Washington, which most people would look at me and say, <laughs> you are crazy. And now I look at the Super Bowl ring in the box, and I say, yeah, but – I'm crazy good. You know, it was it was <laughs> it was really fun. Like I would take that, right? And see, I love that. And I, it sounds like the Super Bowl ring is the representation of the journey. But it's not about the ring. It's no. it's the journey that you took and the hard work that you invested in yourself that resulted, hopefully, right? Because not every single player gets that, right? They spend their entire career working for that. Everybody has a poignant moment. Mine just happened to be when I opened the box, Mm. right? And it makes me a little teary thinking about it. And I will tell you, you cannot see the picture, but the ring was actually sized for my middle finger. The the players had it sized to their ring finger. It's a huge (laughs) ring. And so on a player's ring finger, it looks like a normal ring. Well, they they told the women in the organization, you know, you should probably have it sized to your middle finger because it's so big and so... I did take a picture with just that ring on my finger, and it's just for me because I was told a number of times, women don't do sports. You don't belong here. You aren't broadcast quality. You're not pretty enough. You're not what we want. I've heard it all. I've heard all the names. So that was just that moment of... I'll show you suckers. I got it. <laughs> well, and I love that. And and to use it as the motivation, right? Whatever the motivation is, that no one was going to prevent you from getting to where you deserve to be. It was just stubbornness. I told yeah. you. <laughs> it's just me being <laughs> stubborn. I don't know that. when to say no. I love it. Okay. Well, so let's actually, I, w- I could listen to stories about that kind of stuff all day just because you can apply that to almost anything, mm-hmm. right? In, in sports, yes. outside of sports, in business. So let's actually talk about, let's get into the meat of why we're here today. You know what, let's just talk about the why it works in business. Having folks think about how they can integrate it into a professional um, environment. Right. Yeah. And so it's my job as a broadcaster to talk about sports for a living. And we talk a lot about the wins and the losses and the X's and O's. But as a business owner and as a business consultant, what I do is make sure that people understand how to make sports conversations useful useful in their business relationships and networking. And that means you have to look at it in a bigger scope, right? And understand that sports is more than scores and stats. It would be like looking at the very center of a bullseye and only seeing that little black dot in the middle and not realizing that there's these rings around it that also mean that you hit the target, 
right? And so when you take a look at sports and people say all the time, well, I don't, I don't really see how that applies. Well, let me show you how big this is. Number one, if you look at the surveys of people in the United States who say that they are sports fans every year, more than half of all Americans say that they are sports fans. So if there are what? 316 million people in the United States alone, that means that you are connected to over 150 million people. And that's just, that that means that you're not cold calling those people. That means that you can make a connection with over 150 million people. And oh, by the way, every room that you walk into probably has one of those sports mm-hmm, fans. Mm-hmm. So now you don't have to be quite so nervous about <laughs> going to a networking event or what are you, what am I going to talk about today? And on that same track, you don't have to worry about what you're going to talk about every day because sports is the only DVR proof material on TV today, which is why Advertisers pay so much money to be involved in the Super Bowl. You know, years ago, you all used to talk about the same television shows at the water cooler the day after. Mm -hmm. So Seinfeld, Friends, ER, you know, all of those great shows, that was the big talking point at work. And then DVRs came into existence and it changed our viewing patterns. And now we binge watch and we stream and we do all of these things, which is great, except that you and I are probably never watching the same show on the same night and at the same spot of the Mm storyline. So it's taken away one of those big um, common connectors for us. But sports will never, ever be viewed that way, which means that you have something new to talk about with sports fans every Every single day. And those sports fans include high-level executives, influencers, connectors, and across the board. That's the third thing people need to understand about sports. It gives you access because sports fans talk to other sports fans. I can talk to a six-year-old sports fan and then turn around and talk to a 66-year-old sports fan. They have access to the same amount of information, and we can carry on a conversation, which means in a business setting, if your key influencer, executive, boss, CEO is a sports fan, but you just got hired or you're a recent college grad, or you don't feel like you're on the same managerial level as them, it doesn't matter. It breaks down those walls Hmm. because sports fans want to talk about their teams. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. That's the hardest thing, right? It is entering that conversation, mm-hmm. getting a foot in the door. Sports helps you do that better than anything else. And that's that standard kind of universal commonality yes. that that most humans have. Know your audience, though, right? Like, Absolutely. So if, if you have identified someone within your office that perhaps isn't as big of a sports fan, you want to take that into consideration, but it shouldn't stop you from perhaps even entering into that conversation. Right. And so people ask me all the time, it's like, okay, that's great for the people who are sports fans. What happens if you strike up a conversation with a non-sports fan? Then what am I supposed to do? And my response is always the same. I still use sports as my go-to every single time. Because the answer to the question, did you see the game last night? It's one of two answers. It's either yes or no. And quite honestly, I don't care which one it is. If the answer is yes, I saw the game. Well, now I know that my follow-up line of questioning is, okay, well, what did you think? And who's your favorite player? And what are the implications? And give me the breakdown. If the answer is no, then my journalistic instincts kick in. And I go, oh, well, what were you doing last night? Mm. Right? Which is a whole lot easier than walking up to somebody and go, hey, what would you do last night? (laughs) Right? That's weird. And it's also easier than saying, hey, are you into basket weaving? Do you like to go hiking? (laughs) Do you go wine tasting? What kind of shows do you like to watch? Then that's a weird game of 20 questions. Sports cuts to the chase. Yes or no? Don't care. I just need to know how to proceed with this conversation, right? And then that tells you who your audience is. Yeah. Yeah, So you're not stabbing in the dark. It can create an open-ended conversation or an open-ended question if it is no. Um, And that's a great segue. So for the folks that perhaps aren't as extroverted, right? (laughs) Let's talk about Are there some <laughs> are there some that don't talk as much as I do cuz I'm I'm pretty sure that everybody <laughs> likes to talk as much as I do. <laughs> 
but it's not always up to the extroverts to start that conversation. No. So perhaps as an introvert, when you look at some networking tactics, it could be, I don't know that I really have figured out how to start a conversation with my CEO, but I noticed that he wears his favorite jersey on Fridays. Oh, yes. Or she came into work and started talking about the big college game that happened over the weekend or that she got an opportunity to actually take her kid to mm-hmm. the game or homecoming. It's a great segue whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So it's an alternative universe and I'm an introvert. <laughs> 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 and I come into work on Monday morning and I keep seeing the same group of coworkers standing around having coffee and they're talking about the big game on the weekend. I want to be a part of that conversation because as part of that conversation, they're having business conversations mm-hmm. as well and talking about what's happening and what's coming up, you know, coming down the pike. How do I make sure that I can get into that conversation next Monday? Well, I would say, number one know exactly what it is that they're talking about. And I don't mean the stats and the salaries and the rules, but but understand what's generally driving that conversation and start to build your knowledge base around that. And it is as easy as picking up a sports page on Monday morning and reading the sports headlines. You don't have to read the stories, but if all you have time to do is read the headlines you're going to find that that gives you about five to eight pieces of information to use in the conversation because headlines are written to give you the synopsis of the story. And we, you know, part of it is just feeling comfortable that you've got a couple of tidbits to add to that conversation. The other part is just put yourself in that environment, intentionally, not on the periphery, not standing on the other side of the room and observing what's going on, but get a little closer, right? And say, oh, I heard you talking about that play, or I heard you talking about that outcome. Hey, what'd you think about how that all played out? You don't have to actually talk about the game, the play, the rule, the stat. You need to show an interest and allow somebody to tell you what they think. Mm. Because a sports fan who wants to talk about their team or their favorite player just wants an opening to do that. Mm -hmm. And quite honestly, if you are the new person in the group and they see somebody new that they have a chance to evangelize (laughs) to about their team, their sport, their player, they are going to jump on that opportunity. Here's what happens, though. People try to do too much in that situation. If you are a novice sports fan, you try to insert yourself in a more assertive way. And that's where people start to feel the, well, I'm faking it. I'm not being myself. I'm just lying to people. No, you're not. You need to look at this as a relationship building opportunity and networking within your own company. That happens all the time. And here's why it's important. Your coworkers need to know that they like you and that they trust you, right? When that happens, now you're more productive at work, right? But unless your business is sports like mine is, that sports conversation is not going to last very long. It might feel like forever (laughs) to you, but I guarantee you in the grand scheme of things, it's not going to last very long. And eventually that conversation is going to turn to business and you want to be part of that when it happens. Mm. It might not seem like much, but that's the moment where they're going to say, oh, hey, by the way, did you see that that deadline just got changed? Did you see that that project, it just got tweaked a little bit? By the way, we're not meeting on Thursday, we're meeting on Friday. Now, if you walked away from that conversation, will you eventually find out any of those business details. Yeah. Is it going to be detrimental? Meh, maybe not. But how much easier would it be if you were all standing there having that conversation? And more importantly, as your career develops and you have these relationships with people, you become a person that they actively and willingly engage with on a regular basis about sports and otherwise. And this is how you get your opinions heard and valued on projects. This is where you find out about opportunities for you to advance, right, and to speak up. You can't just sit in your own little cubicle and think that the world is going to come to you. This is one way to just kind of build a bridge and to build that relationship with people that you work with. And and just that engagement, that additional engagement level, and that if the investment is 
reading a sports page or getting the highlights from ESPN the night before. Yep. And that you engage in a 10-minute conversation on Monday mornings, that 10-minute investment is going to do wonders for your career. Yes. And I am going to be like the parent that makes you eat your broccoli or the <laughs> um, or the trainer that makes you run when you don't want to. I don't care if you like sports or not. I really don't. I am going to tell you that it is one of the best things you can do for your career. I can walk into any room. I don't have to know anybody, but within 20 seconds, I know that I can make a connection because I talk sports and I drink whiskey. <laughs> and I become a very popular person. I I have no business talking to CEOs and executives of huge companies. I am a broadcaster. My industry is totally different. And yet I can get meetings and I can get FaceTime and I can build relationships that are genuine because I have this. That might not be your area of expertise, but why wouldn't you want to have all of the tools at your disposal? You are a rock star with what you do. And when the conversation turns to business and your skill set and what you bring to the table, you will rock it. But until you get to that conversation, you better be using all of the tools to find the foot in the door. Because I can't tell how much of a rock star you are if I didn't have more than a five second conversation with you. Yep. Yeah. And sports is going to be one of those easier topics to use as a segue. Should be. Can you practice with people? On the bus. Like, you know, you see a lot of people wearing jerseys, right? Yes. So, you know, standing in line at the grocery store, you're buying bread and milk and it's just a part of your every day. Is there an opportunity to just kind of practice on strangers as well? <laughs> to be like, oh, well, how about them? I'd like to think that nobody's a stranger when I start talking to them. I kind of treat them all like we're BFFs. <laughs> Absolutely. And here's the first thing you need to know about that situation. If you see somebody wearing a jersey or wearing the logo of a team, they want you to know that they're a fan of that team. They are wearing it for a specific reason. It is like begging you to start the conversation (laughs) with them. If they didn't want you to have that conversation, they would have worn the suit and tie that they always wear. They would not be wearing purple to indicate that they are a fan of a certain college team. They, They would be hiding it. Fans are really proud of their teams. And in business settings, they show it in a lot of different ways. It could be participating participating in a casual Friday and wearing a jersey or a logoed shirt. It could be the license plate holder on their car. It could be just the color of tie that you see them wear on a certain day every day. And you think, why are you wearing a blue tie every single Friday? It could be that in their cubicle or on their desk, they've got some little indicator, some sort of tchotchke, right? So you have to know that these folks are everywhere and they are begging you to have the conversation, which should reduce some of that fear just a little bit. Also, if you think you spot a fan wearing a jersey, perhaps, let's say it's a Seahawks jersey. All you have to do with a Seahawks fan is say, go Hawks. (laughs) I guarantee you they will repeat that back to you. And all you have to do next is say, what about that game? And quite honestly, can can we be very honest about this? That statement actually works regardless of the outcome of the game, folks. (laughs) In fact, on the website, in the free resource section, there are 55 questions you can use to start a sports conversation, and it does not matter what happened in that game. And see, that's the thing. The sports fan knows, and there's going to be some people listening that goes, yeah, I'm just faking my way. No, you're not, because you would do the same thing in any other walk of life. You would do the same thing about a news story you haven't read. Oh, I I saw the headline on this. I didn't get a chance to read the Mm. article. I saw the Boston Celtics won. I didn't get a chance to see what happened. What happened? That's all you have to do. Yeah. And I think if you're just looking to practice on strangers and have an interaction, it's just having that positive reinforcement that you correctly identified a sports fan and they did not walk away or look at you like you grew a third eye, (laughs) or, you know, gave you this look like you were nuts. Yeah, because they've opened the conversation. You're there. You're right there. You can choose to engage in a bigger conversation if you want to. Yeah. Or you can just choose to get off at your next stop and have a bigger conversation with somebody that you actually already know at work. Yeah. I remember walking through uh, San Francisco airport in the middle of football season uh, last season, and we spotted 
someone wearing a Seahawks jersey that was going up the escalator as we were coming down. And I felt compelled to say, go Hawks. Yeah. Very quietly. <laughs> <laughs> it was this whisper and he kind of leaned over as well. And we kind of did the go Hawks thing. But you're right. I mean, that's two words right there. Go Mariners, go Angels, go go whomever. It yeah. works in any country you're in. I have traveled um on vacations, right? I have traveled with sports teams. And there's nothing quite like being in a foreign country. You don't speak the language, right? You're trying to navigate a whole bunch of new circumstances, but you see somebody wearing a jersey. It might not even be of your team, but you recognize what that jersey is. And you think... Gosh, at the very least, there's another sports fan over there, right? Like, at the very least, that person has cheered for the Boston Red Sox, and they know who David Ortiz is, and I know who David Ortiz is. Like, okay. We got something in common. We got something in common. (laughs) If all else breaks down, I'm going to go talk about the Boston Red Sox, right? I was going through the Panama Canal. There's somebody wearing a Russell Wilson jersey at the front of the boat. I didn't know anybody on that boat. And then you think, okay, well, at least there's another Seahawks. Okay. (laughs) Well, because that's what we do when we walk into a room. We look for the commonalities, right? Because we want to make a connection with another human being. So look for the jersey, look for the hat, right? Look for the scarf that someone might be wearing in the winter. That's awesome. So you actually mentioned the free resources that are on Mm -hmm. your website, talksportytome.com. But you actually also have a newsletter, which actually speaks like tips on the five-minute conversation. Yes. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. So one of the things I make sure that I do every Monday morning by 7 a.m., I help you become sports savvy. And I do the work for you. It is the sports cheat sheet, five or six topics that fans are going to be talking about across the country. So it's not region specific, but these are I I try to identify the bigger topics that are already in the news or that will be in the news that week. And it's about three sentences for each one of those. And it's just a quick synopsis. If you were to really break down those three sentences, again, you would find that there's about five to eight pieces of information, which is more than enough for you to strike up a conversation with somebody else or just be aware of the conversations taking place around you. It lands in your inbox every Monday morning. It takes you about two minutes to look through. Choose to engage in a conversation or not. Part of it is just building up your sports knowledge base in an easy way. And then throughout the week, there's different tips about how to apply conversations that I actually hear in the locker rooms Mm. or from coaches into a business setting. So it's all about making this another tool in your for you. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, and no one in that instance can say, well, it'll just be too hard because, like you said, you're giving it to them. You're doing the work that lands in their inbox and then they all have, all I have to do is sign up. So check out TalkSporty2Me.com. We'll actually have more information about ways to contact Jen in the show notes. But we're actually going to take a quick break right now. But when we come back, Jen, I actually want to chat with you or have you chat more about how you put it all together. Thanks for listening. Be sure to check out the show notes at thecareerq.com where you can also subscribe to the podcast and sign up for our newsletter. So welcome back. We're here with Jen Mueller. And uh, Jen, before the break, we actually, we talked a lot about a lot of great stuff, but what I'm really interested in, in knowing is how you put this into play into your office environment, which just turns out to be a locker room. Yeah. 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 It's not nearly as glamorous as people <laughs> think. It it smells a lot, and you're dealing with a lot of sometimes angry men. So, you know, there's a lot of factors at play. But here's what I'll tell people. What looks like spontaneous questions and post-game interviews are actually based on very strategic conversations that I have over the course of weeks, months, and sometimes years with these players. And the first thing is understanding their preferred communication style, which, by the way, is not my communication style. And this is true for uh, most of the time for men versus women. And let me just cut to the chase on this. You will never, ever hear me ask after a game, how does it feel? Interesting. Because I don't care 
no man has just opened up about his feelings on any subject and just given the best answer of his life. I'm not going to do that on live television or radio, and I'm not going to do it because most of the time men are driven by information in a conversation. It's women that are driven by connection, and we make connection through that emotional piece, right? And this is a generalization, but it's certainly true for me. And so for as much as I want to get to the to the heart and soul of it, the guys want to talk about very tactical things, things that they can dig into with details and information. So for me, it starts with just understanding who I'm talking to and making sure that the questions appeal to them. Second thing, understanding that if the only time I ever approach an athlete or a coach is when I need something, the chances of them opening up to me are very slim. So every day I stand at practice for as long as I can. Every day when I'm in a locker room, I go and make the rounds and we chat about things other than the game, other than the sport. And these conversations start very small and it could be something as small as saying, Hey, Chris, how are you today? And then the next day, hey, I saw you made that great play in practice. That was pretty awesome. And I don't want anything from them. I just want to acknowledge them. Right. I have found that on average, it takes about five interactions with a player before he starts to let his guard down and open up to me. And I've also found that in business, it's about the same. And you don't really want to do that in one day. But over the course of the week, and I know who the introverted athletes are. I know who needs a little bit of extra love to open up. And those are the guys that I have a strategic plan for. I know what I'm going to talk to them about. I know when I'm going to talk to them. And I can predict about when they're going to be willing to do a post-game interview with me. Here's what this means for you. If I am this strategic about my conversations because it's my job to have these conversations, I know that it works to be this strategic about yours. You already have the benefit of knowing that sports is a great entry point into this relationship building process. So you can take the same approach. Identify three people that you want to talk to or that you want to network with. Write those names down. The second thing you need to identify is, are they driven by connection or detail? If you're talking about a sports framework, somebody who is driven by detail actually wants to know the stats and the scores of the game. Somebody who's driven by the connection piece wants to talk about how it felt to be in the stands, how they feel about their team's win. Okay? So you're just, same topic, you're just structuring the questions differently. But here's the key piece. You have got to stay on their radar. It cannot be a one-time thing. And sports helps you in this way, too, because there's built-in follow-up opportunities. Sports happens year-round, and a sports season lasts a minimum of seven months, which means I can physically go into my calendar, which is a paper one that I love to use my <laughs> colored pens on, and write down, send email to Stacy about Seahawks playoffs. Send email to Chris about start of baseball season. Send email about tough loss to Jane. Whatever this is, I can actually map out those five interactions, and I know what I should be talking to each person about. That's how you get on somebody's radar. That's how you get them to open up. That's how you build the relationship. It works in the locker room, and it works in business. And once you've built that relationship, there becomes a predictability or a dependency on mm -hmm. that continued relationship as well. So if there happens to be um, an instance or the start of spring training for baseball and, you know, you're out of the country and you're, you know, completely offline, which, you know, kudos to the people that can actually um, <laughs> achieve that, but... That if you're if if Chris doesn't get that email from you on the first day of spring training, he's going to be like, where's Jen? Why haven't I received my yearly spring training email mm -hmm. from Jen that reminds me that I need to be in Arizona or she's asking me about, you know, how mm -hmm. things are at spring training. So it's that over a longer period of time is making sure that there is that warm connection that you have, right? Yes. That you're not just sending that one email to Chris. It's over the course of the season, over the course of the year, if there are yes. multiple sports involved. Yes.
Yes. And when I get emails like this, because folks, this is how folks get on my radar and stay on my radar. I am much more likely to respond to an email talking about a big win or a team that I'm covering or the outcome of the game or the start of a season than I am if you're just talking to me about business. Because at that moment, the chances of me wanting to to respond and talk about sports, which is something I'm passionate about, are much higher than me wanting to talk about business. That's not to say I'm not going to get to that email, but you know how many times that it sits in your inbox, you're like, oh, I'll get to that later in the day because I'm not really ready to work. I'm really ready to talk about that Seahawks game. And then <laughs> it slides down to the bottom of your inbox. And then two weeks later, you have not responded to that email. But it, you're going to get the response. Yep. Right. And it's just a different way to react. Also, I know that you're not looking for anything from me in that moment. And after about the third interaction, if this is a new business contact, it's OK to say, hey, before the Seahawks go to the playoffs, could we get together for coffee? Yep. Look, the Seahawks, uh, they're going to lock up the bye, and I'd love to have coffee with you before they play their first playoff game. Yep. I'd love to get together with you before the Mariners head to spring training. Yep. I'd love to talk to you. What, whatever your timeline is, sports can give you the deadline and the timeline. Yep. And so do you have recommendations on, on how people can manage that? Um, are there some resources that they can maybe tap into for that? Well, there will be a lot of resources on my website, TalkSportyToMe.com. Go to the free resources. There's templates to use where you can actually fill it out. And when uh, we roll over the calendar, yes, there will be a sports schedule that is laid out by month so that you know which sport you should be talking about at what time of year. That's fantastic. So, Jen, before we actually get into some of the kind of standard fun questions that we have for each of our guests, let's talk a little bit more about that connection piece, because ultimately, as humans, we're just looking for that connection. Do you have some tales from the road where that's actually worked out really well for you, but perhaps didn't look like a quick success? Or did you come away like, oh, maybe I have to look at that or approach that a little bit differently? Certainly, there are things that I would like to approach differently. But I will say that I have had plenty of challenges of trying to get through to people. And one of the biggest ones, and I wrote about this in my book, Talk Sporty to Me, Thinking Outside the Box Scores, was the first time I was introduced to Ken Griffey Jr., who is now a Hall of Famer. And when I was first introduced to him, it was in spring training. He was on his second stint with the Mariners. I had not been in Seattle when he was with the team previously. And as a reporter who works for the team, it's my job to sit down with interviews with all of these players, right? And so it was a given. I had to talk to Griffey during the spring training. And I walked up and I introduced myself to him. And I said, you know, hey, Ken, my name's Jen. I I work for the television station. At some point, I'd love to sit down and talk to you for about 10 minutes. And he just looked at me and he said, I'm not talking to you today. And I said, well, that's okay. I didn't mean today. I'm I'm here for two weeks. You know, it's fine. I'll catch up with you another time. And he just kind of, you know, nodded his head. I came in that clubhouse every day and he would look at me and say, I'm not talking to you today. And I'd say, that's okay. We still got time. And I would just sit there around his locker and I'd watch him interact with everybody else. And I'd think, okay, eventually he's going to break down. Like my charming (laughs) smile is going to break him down, right? It's just a matter of time. And those two weeks started to go by and I started to really panic because every day he didn't even crack a smile when he said it. So I, I couldn't figure out if he was joking or not. Every day, I'm not talking to you today. And panic was really starting to set in because how do you go back to your bosses and say, the biggest star on the team would not talk to me? One day he comes up to me when I am least prepared and says, okay, I'm ready to talk to you today. And I'm like, I, uh, okay, okay, here we go. Like they, he had no fancy setup. We had no printed questions because it was in the middle of a day where I wasn't expecting it. And later that year, I asked him the question, you know, what was it? Why? He said, well, I didn't know you. I didn't know if I could trust you. And I really didn't know if I liked you until – I watched you for that period of time. I will tell you that um, Griffey was so talkative after the fact that myself and another reporter used to have kind of an exit strategy of, okay, if I'm not back out of the clubhouse in 10 minutes, could you please come and get me? Because he's telling another story and we are on deadline here. He could tell the best stories, right? 
And so cool, cool moment when he gets inducted into the Hall of Fame and I'm in Cooperstown with him mm-hmm. this year. And to to share that, to, yep. to have him even, you know, give me a hug after the ceremony to to acknowledge me as a friend and, and other folks who have worked with him. But knowing kind of how that started and how panicked I was in those <laughs> first 10 days. Yeah, it, it it can take a while with some folks. Well, and that may circle back to that stubbornness, right? Yeah, well, you had a yeah. job to do, but it could also be considered tenacity, right? And that you were bound and determined to develop a connection with this person and that you were willing to wait. And that that ended up becoming way bigger than the locker room conversation, that it bloomed into something yes. that um, will far outlasted his baseball career and and will outlast your broadcasting career as well. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. And so identify the Griffey, right? Whoever the Griffey is in your life or in your career, um, don't be afraid to to start that connection and you may not get that win right away, but um, stick with it. And, and, and your Griffey might be your executive. My father was an executive for a number of years. So I know what his demeanor was. And I do think that being around that, and my father is a very loving, caring person, but my father, the businessman, is very stoic. He's got a very dry sense of humor. And so you think you're not getting through. But what I know about my father is he is very observant. And he pays attention when you have attention to detail and when you're working hard. And and my hard work might not look like I'm working hard when I'm just standing in the locker room for hours and hours, you know, or standing at practice for hours and hours. But that is me putting in my time, right? And so you've got to understand that your boss might show emotion or might show acceptance differently mm. than you would. That doesn't mean that they're not giving you indicators. Right. It doesn't mean that they're not paying attention, right? Your your Griffey might be the person sitting in the in the office next to you. Right. Yeah. And, and so even just being acknowledged, that was the first thing Griffey did to me, right? Acknowledged me. That was a good positive step. Yep. And that was the segue into the opening of the door yes. into that. That's awesome. Okay. So I know that there's so much more that we could get into, and and we, I think, I think we, I, I think that's a kind way of saying you talk too much. <laughs> from, I like, I, you're not going to hurt my feelings because, honest to goodness, every person has told me this. You are identified as America's expert talker. Well, that yep. was also a self-described title because that was the <laughs> nicest way to say I've got over ten thousand hours of talking in my life, <laughs> which makes you an expert. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> well, so let's get into just some of the standard questions, but I think more personal questions. You know, we don't. Don't need to get too personal, but let's let's talk about Jen's first job. What it, what was that job, and what were the fundamentals that you learned in that job that you carry with you today? You know what's really funny is that I've thought about this lately. Um, my first job was as a babysitter. I was looking back. I was the most popular babysitter in three subdivisions. <laughs> I'm not joking. Like, I look and I'm like, I am not qualified to be an entrepreneur. Oh, wait a second. Actually, no, I was hustling babysitting jobs. I created coupons for discounts for baby. I would go door to door and put them on people's doors. I had a network of referrals. I created a box of crafts that I would take for every, like the kids knew to ask for the crafts. And I... It was quite the operation I had going. I had no idea that that was the start of being a business owner. Also, I was making $2 an hour. So you had to get like three subdivisions covered to make (laughs) any sort of money doing that. But... I was a babysitter. It was it was setting you up for for the for the future for That's just the incredible. hustle that it takes yeah. to yeah working yeah. at it every <laughs> single day. I loved it though. I thought it was great. Yeah, That's and I awesome. had my projects and I had my plan of how. Oh yeah. Well, and relationship management, right? You it, it actually was the CEOs of those families were wanting to make sure that they had the right person coming in and taking care of their staff. Yeah, That's, right. That's incredible. Okay, so what have you read, listened to, or watched recently that you'd recommend? It'd be so sad to tell you that I watch the Gilmore Girls every time I need a confidence boost. Okay, here's the deal. Look, I work in a male-dominated field. I hold my own with men who may or may not be wearing pants, right? Like, I got this part. There's a lot of spitting. There's a lot. And sometimes when I just want a little 
I just want to pop in the Gilmore Girls. And if you haven't watched it, I find it incredibly empowering because it's just sharp and it's witty and it's funny. And I want to be Lorelai and be so calm and cool. And mostly I want to eat all the junk food that she eats and never <laughs> gain a pound. I just find it one of those ones where I can tune out and also feel just kind of like, yeah. I can totally rock this tomorrow. I got this. <laughs> well, Jen, hopefully this will make you feel better, but you're not the first guest that's actually oh, recommended the Gilmore Girls. Oh, my gosh. So, I love it. <laughs> so we'll introduce you to Sandra, and uh, you guys can <laughs> trade notes on the Gilmore Girls. That's great. I admittedly have never seen it, but now that it's came, there's a second recommendation, I feel like I need to maybe lock myself away this weekend and, As you and should. take yes. care of it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, so you're sitting across the table having a coffee with 90-year-old Jen. Is this a moment where I hope my Botox has paid off? <laughs> <Did> I... <laughs> so what, what would 90-year-old Jen say to you today? I think 90-year-old Jen would say a couple of things. Number one, you could have enjoyed the ride more. The journey is what it is about. Mm-hmm. Um, I think 90-year-old Jen would also say, you're more than your job, Hmm. which is a hard thing, especially in our industry where it is ultra competitive. There's different external pressures, right, on on being an on-air personality. And I think 90-year-old Jen would say, good job. Yeah. You've got a lot of good stories. Enjoy them. Tell them. That's awesome. I think enjoying the ride is really kind of important to to make sure that we remember that we actually have to enjoy this one because it's not a dress rehearsal, nope. right? This is, it's not a practice game. It's not an exhibition. It is, this is, this is the shot that we have. So that's great. So Jen, how do folks find you? Well, I am online. You can check out the website, TalkSportyToMe.com. There's also YouTube videos. Um, but if you want to talk to me personally, just send me an email. I answer all of the emails. It's Jen, J-E-N, at TalkSportyToMe.com. So if you have a question, like more information, there's something on the website that you want to learn more about. That's great. I'm there. So we'll actually have your contact information on the, on the career queue included in the show notes. And we'll have a link to Jen's resources and to Jen's websites. And be sure to check her out on social media. Mm -hmm. You're very active on social media. I love it. I love seeing the the game day stuff as well that you have. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Yes. I'm on Twitter at Jen Talks Sports. Or I'm also at Talk Sporty to me. Check us out on thecareerq.com and we will talk to you again soon. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Be sure to head on over to thecareerq.com where you can get more information, show notes, and related articles to today's topic. Also, if you like what you're hearing, head on over to iTunes, subscribe to the podcast, and make sure you leave us a rating and a review. We'd love to hear your feedback. Thanks again. The Career Q podcast is produced by Lens Group Media and recorded at Jack Straw Cultural Center in the lovely Seattle, Washington. I just said my thing. Just edit that onto the end. You're fine. (laughs) I, I really, I've talked enough.